I'm going to do a short introduction and then uh, turn it over to Dr. Roughgarden. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, hopefully you're out there somewhere. Um, today it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Joan Roughgarden. Um, Joan did her undergrad at the University of Rochester and her PhD at Harvard. She started as an assistant professor at UMass Boston, but quickly left for Stanford, where she stayed for nearly 40 years. Um, in 2011, she retired from Stanford, uh, but took a new post at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which is where she is right now. Um, during her long career so far, she has authored nine books and nearly 200 scientific articles and mentored numerous students, including several who have launched their own independent research careers, which is, I think, always a mark of um, great success. Um, Joan's research is focused on understanding the ecology and evolution of biotic interactions using both field experiments, and she's particularly known for her mathematical theory and, and verbal theory development. Um, that during her career, she's focused on different biotic interactions. So first, a particular focus on competition, later a shift to sexual selection. And now more recently, she's focused on this sort of new and very timely set of biotic interactions known as the hollow bion, which we'll hear about today. Um, and her work has integrated economics theory and game theory uh, to bring together perspectives from ecology and evolution in a way that I think um, has really shaped our field. Um, so I first became aware of Joan's work in graduate school when she published a very controversial paper saying, I think mostly correctly, that our fundamental theories about sexual selection are completely wrong, um, nearly all aspects of them, the ones that are in textbooks. Um, so that, you know, as you can imagine, led to considerable debate, um, but I think initiated a process of deconstructing and maybe to some extent reconstructing some of our ideas about sex differences, sex roles, sexual behavior, and the function of sexual reproduction itself. Um, she won't be talking about these topics today, but I think it's really worth pointing out how valuable it is to have people in our community who will rigorously question the very foundation of our field. So something for us all to think about. Um, so no one here came here to hear about me, so I'll be turning it over to Joan really quickly, but I wanted to particularly thank Lisa Evans, Helena Mitchie, and Kate Beckingham for all the work that went into producing this visit. So Joan was actually one of the first seminar speakers that we had to cancel in 2020 due to the pandemic. And we have tried to reschedule an in-person visit numerous times. I'm sure you can imagine why that didn't work out, but it, they, we put in a lot of work and, and I wanted to acknowledge them. Uh, and of course, Joan as well for being incredibly accommodating with all these changes. Um, if you're interested in learning about a completely different aspect of Dr. Roughgarden's scholarship, please join us at 7 p.m. for the Martell Lecture, which, uh, hosted by the Center for Women, Gender, and Sexuality at Rice, where she will be speaking about the gender binary in nature across human cultures and in the Bible. Um, you should have gotten many emails from me already about this lecture, but if you still don't know how to register, I will be happy to help you. Please send me an email. Um, okay, and so with that, I would love to turn the mic over to Dr. Roughgarden, who will be telling us about hollow biont evolution. Great. Well, thanks for that lovely introduction, Julia. And uh, also uh, thanks to you and to Kate and to Lisa Evans for all the work you've put into this and for inviting me in the first place and uh, for, for arranging for me to speak to you via Zoom, which, which is obviously plan B, but uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to talk with you all. And as you know, the, the title of the seminar is about holobiont evolution, and I've been working very hard over the last several years, last three or four years, to develop population theory for the holo, for the holo genome. And this field has its own little jargon. So let me uh, clarify what that's all about. Um, let's see, here we go. So the microbiome uh, is a term coined by, um, I guess, Letterberg and McCray, an ecological community of commensal, symbiotic, and pathogenic microorganisms, and this is really neat, that shares the body space of a host. So it's in the host. Or, or around it, you know, really, <laughs> really with it. 
And a holobiont is a composite organism consisting of the host with its microbiome, and that's due to Lynn Margulis in 1991. And the hologenome is the union of all host genes with all the genes in its microbiome. So it's an expanded genome. And this term was coined by Zilber Rosenberg and, and uh, Gene Rosenberg in 2008. And then I've kicked in another piece of jargon. The hologenotype is the configuration of the hologenome in a particular holobiont. And this is important because an evolutionary theory of holobionts would deal with the change through time of the hologenotype frequencies. And so we need this if we're going to have a theory for holobiont evolution that parallels in some sense the theory for uh, regular genetic evolution for nuclear genes. And then holobiont selection is the differential reproduction and or the survival of the holobionts depending on their hologenotypes. Now, here's the problem, okay? How does microbiome host integration evolve? And let me just tick off some examples due to Scott Gilbert, um, for particularly for mammals and humans. So for example, Anatomically, we are colonized by microbes at birth. Nearly half of our cells or half of our cells are bacterial, and each of us houses about 160 major bacterial species. Oh, physiologically, over 30% of the metabolites in mammalian blood are products of microbes. And these chemicals maintain and coordinate our nervous system, skeletal systems, digestive systems, immune systems, and endocrine systems, and there's data for all of this. Developmental, the Scott is particularly keen on this. Guts cannot be properly formed without the help of, micro of microbes because microbes activate gene expression in cells destined to become the gut. And also the mammalian brain doesn't form popular, uh, properly without microbes. Now, similar integration between microbiomes and their hosts occurs throughout the animal kingdom from corals to sponges to ticks to termites to legumes to literally every multicellular organism. This is a big problem. How does this integration evolve? Now there's um, some debate on, on this and the, uh, the field, if, if anything, is marked by debate uh, as it begins. So the issue is whether or not the holobiont is a unit of evolution. And uh, Lynn Margulis, who coined the phrase, uh, coined the term, uh, ha has advocated that it is. And other proponents of the holobiont as a, as a uh, unit of evolution are, are listed here with their photographs. And there, on the other hand, are skeptics about this, and they're listed on the right. And they do not consider the holobiont to be um, usefully or validly viewed as a unit of evolution. And the reason there's a disagreement has to do with the mode of transmission of uh, the microbes. And um, now, of course, nuclear genes are transmitted vertically in the sense of going from parent to offspring. But the genes in microbes, for the most part, are not transmitted vertically. The, the microbes from from the parents in one generation uh, go out into the environment somewhere, and uh, and then the, the young from the next generation are colonized by the microbes from from the environment that were previously placed there by their by their parents, and so this leads to the idea that the uh, genes uh, in a holobiont that are carried by microbes rather than in the nucleus, that these genes can't be active in evolution because um, any traits they cause are an acquired trait. The genes are coming from the environment and therefore the traits they produce are coming from the environment and as an acquired trait it wouldn't be, presumably wouldn't be open to evolution or be, be um, uh, eligible for, for evolutionary change. And so therefore the people on the right say, well, the holobiont uh, is a nice word maybe, but it really is not very useful 
because uh, in fact uh, the genes aren't uh, the genes carried in the microbes are not vertically transmitted and implicitly the people on the left tend to agree with this uh, they claim they disagree with it but but they actually are quite defensive and they try to show that there is actually more vertical transmission than you might have guessed because uh, for example a bird um, will ac accumulate the microbes from um, wh when it's a chick in the nest the, the, from the microbes that are in the nest and left there by the parents and similarly as we just discussed uh, um, embryos pick up uh, parental microbes during the birth when passing through the birth canal and so various mechanisms like this particularly in a ter terrestrial environment tend to lead to a some amount of vertical transfer but um, I accept the point made by the people on the right here that that that's unusual or, or relatively special case and that the generic case is for horizontal transmission of microbes however um, the observation that there is horizontal transmission is by no means fatal and it has to do with a misunderstanding of uh, the conditions for evolution uh, that trace to the, uh, the f famous statement of Lewontin. Now Lewontin in 1970 enunciated three conditions that were necessary for, for uh, evolution by natural selection. The first is phenotypic variation, second is differential fitness, and the third is the way he put it is fitness has to be heritable. And uh, that, that third statement really isn't correct um, as stated. The issue is not whether uh, the offspring uh, carry traits directly from the parents. They have to, the, the, select, the, the offspring have to re, uh, reflect the traits of the selected parents. And so I've pointed out that there's a distinction between collective versus lineal inheritance. Traditional inheritance has the offspring. So for example, in this diagram here, the, the genes being favored by natural selection are in green, those being opposed by natural selection are in brown. And so with lineal inheritance, the way the offspring in the next generation get the, the, the favored genes is by direct transmission from the parents. However, that's actually not necessary. Those parents that are selected could contribute their genes to a common pool, and that, and that pool could be the source of the genes that are placed into the new generation. This would be collective inheritance. And this works just fine. And this is completely Darwinian. This would underwrite uh, natural selection, uh, um, leading to gradual change through, through descent, descent with, through modification. And it's uh, perfectly Darwinian. It's just not Mendelian. And so uh, the objections by the folks on the, on the right who are very critical of this are not valid and I think we can put behind set aside now the issue of whether or not uh, horizontal transmission is fatal and so I'll in fact be taking horizontal transmission as the generic case some earlier work I did compared horizontal and vertical transmissions but uh, I don't feel there's much point in spending much more effort on vertical transmission of the microbiome because it's not that it's not common enough to merit, um, I think, at least uh, attention at this time. However, okay, if the question of uh, inheritance is settled, uh, we then rise up. Uh, the, what then arises is the, is the issue of how you get adaptive change. And the people on the right, I think, somewhat uh, naively, if you'll permit me for me to say that, think that, well, existing coevolutionary theory can just be applied to holobionts and, and the integration of the, the uh, microbiome in the host can just be explained by invoking coevolutionary theory, existing coevolutionary theory. The problem is that uh, coevolutionary theory, is, as we've had for the last several decades, is a, un a single level, unilevel uh, process. 
in which there's one species right here, say a, a pollinator, and another species, say a plant, and uh, the gene frequency of, say, the pollinator goes from time t to time t plus one, depending on fitnesses that depend on its own gene frequency as well as the gene frequency of the other species. Conversely, in the plant, then the, the, the uh, again, the uh, gene frequency in the plant goes from t to t plus one, depending on its fitnesses that depend on uh, the other one, the other species. Uh, gene frequencies. So you get coupled evolution going on because the fitness of in each species depends on the properties of the other species, but it's still at a single level. And uh, so in co-evolutionary, in, in, hol in holobiont evolution, we're dealing with a multi-level uh, selection situation in which one species is living inside the other species. And, um, and so the People uh, on the left who are in favor of the holobiont concept argue that some process of holobiont selection is responsible for the uh, integration of, ge of genomes in their, of um, microbiomes in their host. And uh, what this indicates is that the fitness of somebody who's inside the host, say the green one here, is a function its fitness is a function both of its within host fitness, which is, as you'll see, the within host carrying capacity, and the between host fitness. So that you get us an expression that I've been calling the multi-level fitness, which is the product of the within host and the between host fitnesses. Meanwhile, the host has only the uh, uh, the, the host fitness, so it's not a multi its, its evolution is not multi-level. It's only the, 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 uh, micro, the microbes that are multi-level. And from here you go from a set of hologenotype frequencies at time t to hologenotype frequencies at time t plus one. Fine. So if we agree that uh, holobion evolution is a multi-level process, then we might say, well, let's just apply the now decades of work of multi-level selection to the holobiont, and the, the, the job is done. However, existing multi-level selection types don't cover the, holo, the holobiont. And the, the, holo, the, micro, uh, the multi-level selection literature uh, identifies two types of multi-level selection which are called type one and type two. And I wish the names were better, but that's what the literature has. And the first one, the type one, is sometimes called the haystack model after a paper written by John Maynard Smith that used haystacks. And here, um, the, the outer level is actually not an organism. It's a property of the environment. And in the case of Maynard Smith's paper, he was envisioning that the outer level of the multi-level of the two levels is a haystack. And he was looking at mice. And so the little particles right here are mice. And so some mice are cooperative and other mice are mean to one another. And the haystacks that have cooperative mice um, were assumed in his model to, uh, to produce more mice than the haystacks with uh, mean and nasty mice. And the upshot is that uh, uh, from this pool of mice, uh, the next generation of haystacks is then colonized over here. But the haystacks don't evolve. Okay, they're just parts. Uh, they're just they're just vessels in the environment within which the uh, uh, social behavior can can uh, can take place. Now, multi-selection level type two is one where the, uh, the host, the outer level, does evolve, and, the, and it evolves together with the, uh, uh, lower, the lower level. But there's vertical transmission. So here we have a, a host that contains um, good genes, um, 
genes that are being favored and and the offspring resemble that microbiome or, or, or resemble that holobiont because they are inherited as a unit and so this would correspond with uh, holobionts where the micro microbiome is vertically transmitted but if we take the case where the microbiome is horizontally transmitted, we then actually get a combination of these two, type 1 and type 2, which I'm calling type 3. Now, it's not a very imaginative name, but why not? And uh, so in this case, we're getting a collective inheritance of the selected microbes at the lower level, and, uh, the micro and then the host evolves as well. So the host, so in the next generation, we get the same sort of outcome we had here, only we're getting it via um, collective inheritance of the microbes. So therefore, uh, we really do need some new theory. Um, we need to develop uh, multi-level selection type three. And so what I'll do is show you uh, how I've done that uh, as of this time. Um, and there are two parts to, the, to what I'll show you. The first is purely population dynamics, no evolution at all. And the second part is where we do have evolution. Because it's actually not obvious that a host and a, micro, a microbe can coexist if one is living inside the other. And for it to coexist, the, the population dynamic properties, just the population dynamics of the microbe have to line up enough with a host so that they uh, can work together. Now, this, here's the setup. So I'm imagining at the beginning over here, we have a, a pool of hosts that are not yet colonized. And over here, we have a pool of microbes. And and then I'm assuming that there's Poisson sampling. So each micro, each host, juvenile host, gets uh, some microbes according to a Poisson sampling process. And this is, you undoubtedly know, is, is like the kind of uh, process uh, for a Geiger counter. And so, so the number of ticks per second of a Geiger counter is a Poisson distribution. And, <laughs> Interestingly enough, uh, back in the 1930s, um, some microbiologists actually demonstrated that the number of virus particles in a bacterium is Poisson distributed. So this is a pretty well justified assumption for, for random colonization. So after the uh, hosts are colonized, we have two kinds of hosts, namely those that didn't get colonized and those that are. And then here's an assumption. I'm assuming that, that the generation time of the microbes is fast enough that they come to equilibrium to, uh, uh, within the host. So K1 right here is the carrying capacity within a host for microbes of strain one. And then uh, after the hosts obtain community equilibrium, uh, after the microbes obtain community equilibrium within the host, then the holobiont selection occurs. So here's a, uh, uh, a host with microbes, and here's one without. And so there's a fecundity rate for, uh, for hosts without any microbes, and so that they contribute to the host source pool. And also the uh, hosts with microbes produce more hosts, in this case, more than that, if it's a, if it's a good microbe, and uh, they also contribute. However, the the micro the, the holobionts with microbes are the only ones who contribute um, microbes to the microbial source pool. And at this point, the process occurs all over again. So uh, uh, we get a, a dynamical model for. Uh, the distribution for the numbers of uh, empty hosts and uh, hosts with one microbe through time. And given this setup right here, uh, 
uh, you can derive equations uh, for the the for for the dynamics, and I've been able to solve uh, these equations analytically for the most part, and then to confirm the mathematical solutions with computer simulation, co computer iteration of, of this. There are no actual simulations, there's just computer iteration for certain cases. And here are the model parameters right here. So this, just for reference, is a Poisson distribution. And uh, this, uh, uh, what, there's one parameter in the Poisson distribution, mu here, which is sometimes called the Poisson density. And uh, if this is high, the Poisson distribution is unimodal, and if mu is low, it becomes uh, peaked over here. And there's a nice convenient formula for the number of, um, or, or for the fraction of hosts that are not colonized by any microbes, which is P of zero. And then, uh, and since that's a nice formula, the fraction of hosts that are colonized by one or more uh, microbes is one minus that, which is then refers to all of this. So, um, as a result, micro, microbial populations in the host, in the host colonized by one or more microbes, they all come to equilibrium at K regardless of how many microbes each was colonized with. And that's a nice feature uh, of the model. And the Poisson density uh, at any one time is equal to this coefficient called D, the colonization parameter, which is really important, and G, which is the ratio of uh, microbes to hosts in their source pools. So we wind up getting a model here with only four parameters. K, the equilibrium microbe abundance within a host. W0, which is the fitness of holobionts without microbes. W1, the fitness of holobionts with K microbes. And D is a colonization parameter. And that's about as simple a model as you can probably get for the basic holobiont process. Now, um, whoops. <coughs> Whoa. So, what do you get? Well, you can get the microbe and the host coexisting, which is really nice. So, this would be uh, the output of this model um, uh, in one case. Okay, the top panel shows the log of the holobiont population, the log of the um, total microbe population. This is the ratio of microbes to hosts. And this is these are the hologenotype frequencies. This is the fraction of hosts with no whole no microbes and the fraction of hosts with one microbe. I mean with microbes of strain one. So this would be host coexistence, ho microbe host coexistence. Now that's not the only possibility. You, another possibility that comes up in these models is what I'm calling microbe shedding. And I'm not aware of any other population dynamic model that has this feature to it. So here, the microbe can enter the population. So if you have a bunch of empty hosts and then you introduce microbes, they can enter. And by golly, through time, uh, the host population is increasing and the micro population is increasing, but the ratio of microbes to hosts drops to zero. And the upshot of it is that the microbes can't keep up with the hosts. They're there, but they just wind up being shed. And that leads to uh, through time leads to hosts, a frequency of hosts without any microbes of one, and a frequency of hosts with uh, strain one of zero. And uh, and you so analytically you can get the case, get all these cases right here. And 
uh, you can order them on the, along the axis of the within host uh, fitness. So if the within host fitness is pretty low, then the microbe can't invade the host population to begin with. It just uh, is not a viable habitat for it. Ke, which in for these numerical parameters is turns out to be 50. Um, Ke is the the within host fitness that the microbe has to have in order to enter the population. But it's not good enough. And in this interval in here between Ke and Km, the microbe is shed. At Km, um, you get the beginning of the host and the micro being able to coexist. And then the higher the carrying capacity within host, then the, uh, the better the uh, microbe uh, uh, population is. So this G, G naught over here is the um, asymptotic microbe to host ratio as the uh, within host fitness increases. So that's the complete case uh, for uh, the population dynamics where the microbe is, is advantageous. Now the plot thickens even if the uh, microbe is disadvantageous. So this is a case right here where um, the fitness of the host is say five fourths without any microbes, but it drops to three quarters, three quarters if it has a microbe. So it's a deleterious microbe. In this case, what can happen is that the microbe can enter the population, uh, but as it increases, <laughs> it then starts to drive the host to extinction. And as the host goes to extinction, it goes along with it. However, uh, by golly, the host, the microbe to host ratio comes to a uh, equilibrium and the host and the microbe happily coexist on their way to extinction. So this is a, an unusual dynamic, but it can happen in uh, this kind of setup. So, in the case of a deleterious microbe, the uh, variety of cases is expanded to include this over at the right, where um, there's a critical within host fitness for, for a deleterious microbe, which is enough that uh, um, it crosses this line right here, which is the line which is the line at which the host starts to go extinct. And so for this whole interval over here, the, the fate is, uh, of the holobiont is uh, quite uh, desperate. So this, before there's any evolution, um, the, just the population dynamics of the host and the microbiome can, can get complicated. And it's possible to figure it out, but I don't think it has any ready parallel with the kinds of population dynamic models we've been uh, using since uh, in, in our basic ecology courses <laughs> all these years. I just ha haven't seen uh, models with these properties and it was, it's been hard to figure them out. Now if we introduce, if we go on now and introduce two microbial strains with horizontal transmission, we get a setup like this where there are now two uh, microbial strains and they're here in the gene pool in the uh, microbial source pool here. And now there's independent Poisson sampling of both species or both strains. As there's independent sampling, we then wind up with some holobionts with, not, with no uh, microbes, some with just the green ones, some with the brown ones, and some with both. And then as before, we let the we assume that the uh, time uh, that the generation time of the microbes is fast relative to the host. So these come to microbial community equilibrium. For for this, we have 
the current capacity for strain one, here the current capacity for strain two, and if both are here, we come to a population, a within host population dynamic equilibrium, which would typically be that from the lockable terror competition co uh, equations. And so there'll be a competition coefficient assumed um, uh, uh, in, in this situation. So uh, then they come over here, and now we have each of these contributes hosts to the uh, new juvenile uh, host source pool, and each contributes microbes to the microbial source pool. And again, this uh, cycle repeats itself, and we um, develop equations for uh, the dynamics of this. Now, it doesn't seem practical to, to solve all possible cases of this model. It's um, because it's clearly quite complicated. And instead, what I've done has been to develop cases, uh, uh, example cases of what the model can predict. Now, uh, and these, these see, in my opinion, really quite interesting. Now, uh, first of all, we're used to the idea. So, so, so consider the whole genome. Okay, so the so the whole bion has genes in it that are carried by microbes, and ask what the fate is of this whole bion with those genes. Now, if those genes were in the nucleus, uh, we know that those and and if they were had identical fitnesses, we'd have selective neutrality and we'd have a Hardy-Weinberg law. And with a Hardy-Weinberg law and selective neutrality, you're entitled to say that any change in the gene frequencies is due to of some sort of force, like the force of natural selection or mutation or recombination. That's the typical way we deal with nuclear genes based on the premise of selective neutrality if the genes have equal fitness. But if those genes are carried by microbes, then we don't have a corresponding concept. There's no selective neutrality and there's no Hardy-Weinberg law. So for example, down here, if we have two identical strains, they have the same colonization coefficients, the same carrying capacities within host, no competition between each other, equal host fitnesses, W's, they're all one here. And we start them out at 100 hosts and then 80-20 as the uh, initial ratio of the two genes. And if there were selective neutrality, this ratio would stay constant, but it doesn't. We start over, we look over here at the initial gene frequency, so uh, 0.8 and 0.2, and lo and behold, the initial gene frequencies converge to one half. So this documents just the uh, host population staying constant because all the Ws are one. The uh, uh, microbe population comes to equilibrium and so forth down here. But this is the really key diagram right here. So that means that, uh, that there's this strong push to a 50-50 gene frequency uh, that the colonization process is, is causing. And so if the genes have equal fitnesses, you're going to wind up with a gene frequency of 0.5. And if the genes don't have equal fitnesses, then uh, what you're going to get is a, is a, a resultant of this pressure toward 50-50, the center, c central pressure, with whatever pressure the selection part is pushing. So that gives rise to this conclusion here, that with holobiont selection operating on microbial genes, there's no effective directional selection unless colonization is low. So here, um, take this case here. Okay, we're going to take two, two genes 
in, that are in microbes. And, um, and if the holobiont has, so, so um, strain two is good here. So the fitness of a holobiont with strain, only strain one is just one. The fitness of a holobiont with mixture is two. And uh, the fixture of a holobiont with a pure strain two is three. So this is really strong directional selection. Now, if you had two alleles subject to this selection, you'd know allele two would be fixed right away, but not here. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, uh, colonization coefficient is low. Uh, it is high, I mean. So, so left, uh, the colonization coefficient is 0 0.02. And here we wind up getting, in spite of the directional selection, we wind up getting a polymorphism between the two strains. However, if the colonization coefficient is lower, then by golly, the selected uh, a, a strain can fix in the population. And you can make this graph here, which is the equilibrium frequency of strain one, which is the unfavored strain, okay, as a function of the colonization parameter. So if the colonization parameter is low enough, by golly, directional selection can el eliminate the unfavored strain. But as the colonization coefficient gets high enough, we're getting the colonization um, process overpowering the selection process, leading to the 50-50 gene frequency. Now, this is, a, in some sense, a disturbing result from the standpoint of those who want to argue that holobiont selection on microbial genes is going to do a lot because it's showing that natural selection, the effect or power of natural selection on uh, microbial genes is quite limited. Now, um, so, so this is a case where um, the microbes are identical to one and the microbes themselves are identical to one another except for their impact on the host fitness. Now let's look at the uh, alternative situation where um, the host fitnesses are, are, are the same. So the host doesn't care which microbe is in, is in it. But the microbes themselves um, duke it out. And what you can get in this case is a uh, similar to a patch dynamic model in, in ecology, where you're getting a colonization extinction regional coexistence. So what could happen here is that uh, a, uh, a species which a strain which always goes extinct locally uh, can nonetheless exist in the regional system if it colonizes fast enough. Um, so here's a case where um, strain, strain one drives strain two to extinction right here uh, in, on the left. So so strain two is gone and strain one is uh, 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 wins. And that's because of the competition coefficient set up here that two against one is very, has very limited effect, but one clobbers strain two in competition. So within a host that both occur in, uh, strain one drives strain two to extinction. But on a regional basis, uh, whether strain one can drive strain two to extinction regionally depends on the colonization, per depends on uh, how well 
uh, strain two can do by itself. So if uh, if k two if strain two is got a high enough fitness when it's by itself, then it can come into coexistence with the strain that 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 does displace it within every local occurrence. So this is, this is exactly along the lines of a colonization extinction, uh, regional coexistence uh, setup. Now, uh, another possibility is where the two levels actually interact. Um, so in this case, you can get a holobiont selection rescuing uh, helpful but competitively inferior strain. So this is a case in which you can uh, set up the competition coefficients here such that um, species one always excludes species two. But on the other hand, um, species two uh, helps uh, the host. And then the holobiont selection at the host level can um, rescue uh, the species that would otherwise be be, dis be forced to go forced to extinction at the local level so you get a, you get all these possibilities right here and it's a, it, the population dynamics it, it by itself is pretty complicated but you can sort it out now I'd like to return though to the to the issue of integration that motivates this to begin with. Um, how could you get uh, the integration of host function and microbial function? And this is a problem at the phenotypic level um, because we're going to look at what does a, a microbe do for the host and what does the host do for the for the uh, um, for the microbe. And let's define something called an altruistic effort, X, which measures how much a microbe forgoes its own K to improve the host W. So this could be um, by, say, diverting nutrients. For example, if it's a, if it's a zooxanthellae, then it's going to take some of the uh, uh, sugar that, that the zooxanthellae makes from its photosynthesis and diverts it and gives it to the host. And so it's giving up something. And meanwhile, the host gets something. And this is a cost and a benefit. Now, uh, the microbe's multi-level fitness would be K times W here. And there's going to be an optimal uh, degree of altruism possible, where uh, how much to give up and how much to get. Because the microbe itself benefits. It might lose here, but it would gain there. And in the product, there's going to be an, an optimum. However, it turns out that under this situation, self a selfish uh, microbe will always exclude uh, an altruistic microbe, even an optimally altruistic one. And here's a case right here where the uh, altruistic microbe just goes to zero and the selfish one takes over. So holobiont selection is definitely not maximizing uh, um, multi-level fitness. So what is going on? What could, re what could reverse this tendency to, to microbial selfishness? And uh, I think it, it, what it would require is host intervention. And I'm in, picking up on suggestions of various microbiologists that it's the host antibody production which is a way, which offers a mechanism to discriminate against selfish microbes. And so here, here's a setup for uh, 
what I'm calling a host microbiome game. Now let's just look at the host. The fitness benefit to antibody production, I'm assuming shows a, shows a decreasing return to scale, where alpha here is the amplitude of the benefit, beta is the fall off in the number of as the number of antibodies become large, and the fitness cost is linear. And if that's the case, under those two assumptions, there's a, an optimal antibody production depending on uh, uh, how much uh, alpha here is, what the benefit is. So uh, if, the, if the microbe is deleterious, then there's a lot of benefit, uh, or, or, or even selfish, let's say, there's just a lot of benefit to getting rid of the thing. And so there's a, a, an optimal, uh, antib high optimal antibody production. But if the, if the microbe turns out to be giving something, well then the benefit to eliminating it goes down. And so if you look at these, at the optimums right here, you get an optimum antibody production as a function of how much the microbe is, is giving to it. And so if we take that the amplitude parameter over here, if the amplitude parameter is itself a decreasing function of uh, x, that is, the more the microbe gives to the host, the less benefit there is to the host of making antibodies. So that would lead to a declining curve right here as a function of x. However, a side effect of the antibody production, I want to emphasize that the optimal antibody production takes no account of its implications to the microbe. It's just from the host's point of view alone. You know, like, how much is it worth to get rid of this microbe? Or how much do you want to keep it around? Where, but a side effect of this is that the colonization parameter is affected. And the higher the number of antibodies, well, then the lower the colonization coefficient. And if this gets low enough, of course, then the, the, the microbe can't even colonize the host. So that leads to uh, a, a, a graph like this of the uh, minimum amount of altruism that the microbe has to supply in order to get into the host. So if the current capacity is 20, let's say, uh, if the current capacity of uh, microbes for the host is 20, then if the host gives this level of altruism, it, it can invade. Otherwise, uh, the, the antibody production is large enough that it can't get in. And on the other hand, the microbe can't give more than some minimum amount, than, than some maximum amount, I mean, without going extinct itself. So what the microbe could afford to give would be in this interval here, assuming that's its, that, 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 that this is what it has to play with. Now what in here, how much should the microbe give within this little interval? Well, it turns out it should give as little as possible. <laughs> um, so in this case over here, the uh, microbe is giving uh, uh, oh, so this is a competition right here between two microbes, one of which gives the maximum amount of uh, altruism, and the other gives the minimum amount. So getting over here. So one is giving the minimum amount, and the other is giving the maximum amount. And ideally, it ought to give the maximum amount. If, uh, it, however, if it gives the maximum amount, if, if it gives the very minimum amount, it's excluded. 
and the green over here is the one giving the maximum amount. Aha! Uh -huh. But suppose it gives a little more than the minimum amount. So x2 here is 0 0.0, so it's only 2.5% more. Well, then it comes to a polymorphism between the two, uh, two, two degrees of altruism. And if it gives 5% more, then uh, it actually ex is able to exclude the, uh, the al altruistic one. So the, the, the maximally altruistic one. So in other words, the, uh, the micro can't give the absolute minimum amount, but just a little bit more, and then it can get into the population and when it is, it then excludes uh, any other strain, which is giving more than the minimum amount. So it's pretty uh, stingy. So that gives rise to, this is my last slide, to my hypothesis for what explains microbiome host integration based on this game that the microbes and the hosts are playing. Um, I'm assuming that out in the environment there are a range of there are a lot of hosts here and a range of different microbes some of which uh, ordered along the resources supplied that each supplies to the host and and the ho the microbe has to supply more than this amount right here in order to enter the host at all so this is the antibody level allowing colonization, and this is the optimal host antibody level. So the higher the amount being supplied, uh, then of course that drops the antibody level, which, is, which would be nice. So all of these microbes could get into the host. But unfortunately, once they're there, then the strains which have uh, more than the minimal amount to get into, into the host get excluded, winding up with a holobion that consists of uh, a host, a certain level of antibody production, and a minimum amount of altruism contributed by the host by the microbe to the host. So I'm calling this host orchestrated species sorting or HOS because uh, the evolution within the host of its antibody level feeds back to the uh, possibility of the microbes being able to colonize and only the microbes that can colonize for a given level of antibody body production get into the system and then this interaction equilibrates at this uh, configuration right here. So that would be an integrated microbiome and host. Not ideal from either party's point of view but nonetheless it would it would be scored and would count as uh, uh, an integrated host and microbiome. And so what we have here is an unusual situation in which we're getting basically an evolutionary process at the host level to decide the optimal uh, uh, antibody level and we're getting a population dynamic process at the microbe level in which uh, only some microbes are, are able to colonize. And the interaction of that uh, evolution at one level and micro uh, colonization dynamics at the other level would then lead to, I hypothesize, uh, microbiome host integration. So um, thank you for your attention and I ho hope this was interesting. <laughs>